So welcome. Uh, I'm glad to see you guys. We are in the midst of a study in the book of Exodus. Boy, has it been good, right? We have seen that God of miracles show up and show up and show up and show up and show up. God who has touched and done something. You know, we're in the book of Exodus, and, and the name of the book implies something, right? It implies a movement, an exodus, the, God, that, the fact that God's people have been rescued out of slavery, out of Egypt, 430 years there, and so there has been an exodus by God's hand. So, um, but we're only halfway through the book. So we've already done the exodus, but we're only halfway through the book. As a matter of fact, some of you are really close, you know, in, in your New Year's resolutions, I, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but my guess is some of you had a New Year's resolution to read through the Bible this year. Right? Anybody ever, ever had anything like that, right? I mean, I have, right? Let's read through the Bible in a year. And a lot of you are just about to stop, <laughs> if we're honest, if you've not already. Why? Because you get past Exodus 20, which is not this week. That's actually next week. And then, and then you get into the law. You know, and you start kind of bearing down on that, and you're like, I don't really know, and, ah, and you lose it. Maybe in Leviticus. Maybe you get through, you power through Exodus, you know, and then you get to Leviticus, and you, you, you kind of, ah, die. <laughs> Sound familiar? Yeah, I got you. <laughs> I've been there, too, in the past. That's right. Um, but, you know, Exodus is not just about removing a, a people out of a land. It is about removing a people out of a land, but bringing them to himself. And, and so um, what is cool about this is that we see God really building a nation. Now, his whole purpose, you might remember if you were here, um, for why God had his people in the land of Egypt, right? That's not the promised land. And yet they go into the land um, 74 total in their family, if you count Joseph, who's already there, and his family. 74. They come out 430 years later, 2 million strong. Right? God has built a people and put them in a place to incubate them, if you will, and to grow them. But now he's got to make them a people. And he's got to make them a nation. And so... Um, so that's where we're beginning into. I would love to have just jumped into Exodus chapter 20. And I actually thought about this. And then I thought about what I said to you last week about expository preaching and verse by verse. And I said, I guess I can't skip 19. No, no, no. I was, I was staying at 19. So, um, so if you have your Bibles, open with me to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus is the second book of the Bible. So Genesis, Exodus. So not very far in there. Um, if you don't have a Bible and you don't have one on your phone um, or whatever, you, you know, there's Bibles in the seats underneath you. Uh, second seat in on every row is a Bible. Um, please be, feel free to use that. If you don't have a Bible at home, please feel free to take that. We would love for you to have that Bible and to, and to use it and to keep it. and to Yeah, we would love for that. So go ahead and do that. So we're going to walk through this passage, chapter 19. Um, where they're finally at their, I, would, I guess I would say their first destination. This is not the promised land, but this is the mountain of God. Read with me. Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 and 2 say this. It says, In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. And they set out from Rephidim. They came, when they set out from Rephidim, they came into the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Uh, right? So the Israel's three months out. We, we've seen a lot. We've seen God move. We've seen the God of miracles show up. We've seen the Red Sea part it. We've seen uh, water from a rock. We've seen manna fall out of heaven. Miraculous every day. Miraculous provision of God in them. And finally they come to the mountain of God. And this is a fulfillment of what God told um, Moses, when he first commissioned him to his assignment, back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, God said this to him. He said, and certainly I will be with you, and, you sh and this shall be a sign to you, that it is I who have sent you. When, I, when you brought the people up out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. So fulfillment, right? Fulfillment of what God has said to Moses that I'm going to, I'm going to send you in. I'm going to 
have you be my representative. I'm going to do miracles through you. It's not Moses doing a miracle. It's God doing the miracle, but through Moses. And, and, and God's going to show up, right? And he shows up and he shows up and he shows up. And my guess is, and, and pardon me for adding to anything, right? But my guess is Moses was pretty sure God was with him. But can you imagine getting to Mount Sinai and remembering God, Moses wrote these words a little bit later on probably, but Moses wrote these words. Can you imagine him remembering, God, you said you'd bring me, and that was a sign even that you were with me always. You were with me always. This is nothing about me. This is nothing about that. And so he, he brings them out of Egypt, brings them to himself. They settle in the valley before the mountain. Um, and I want you to remember where they've come from, all right, a little bit of reminder about where we are. So they, they've come from the culture of Egypt. Uh, these people, all they've known is the culture of Egypt. They've never lived anyplace else. You know, their, their fathers and their grandfathers and their grandfathers and their grandfathers and their grandfathers, I don't know how many generations 430 years make up, but boy, you can get a whole lot of generations in there if you have, if you have a child every 20 or 30 years, right? Whole lot of generations in there. And so all they've known is Egyptian culture and, and what's been around them um, in that. And, and, of course, Egyptians culture, Egypt, Egypt's culture sorry, is, is polytheistic. They believe in many gods. There's something like 1,400 gods they would name or they would, they would recognize 1,400 gods out there. And like I told you when we were coming through, Pharaoh would have no issue that they worshipped the god, that there was a god of Israel. They, that, Pharaoh wouldn't have had an issue with that. Sure, Pharaoh's issue was, who is that God to tell me what to do? Because I'm the one in charge. I'm the one with the power. I'm the one who has it all. And then, of course, God showed Pharaoh who God is, right? So uh, Pharaoh knows, or should know anyway. So, um, but remember, they, I mean, they knew something of God, obviously, right? They, they knew their fathers, they were separated from Egypt. They, they did not intermix. Some of that, and why God had them there, is because they were odious in the Egyptians' eyes. Egypt didn't want to mix with them. And, and, and then as they became slaves, you certainly don't want to mess with, mess with slaves, right? Mix with them. So they, they kept separate. They knew the traditions of their forefathers. They knew that they had a God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and pardon me, and I don't know this. We don't really know all of what they did to worship. We don't really know. It doesn't tell us in Scripture. But I know they didn't know much about God. <clears throat> but... They've learned a whole lot about God, right? They've been in a crash course on God. Talk about a great theology class, right? I want to be in that theology class, right, where you learn God not just by reading the Bible and somebody explaining it to you, but seeing him on the move, right? But that doesn't mean that they fully grasp it, but, but they know a whole lot more about God than they did, I don't know, three to six to a year ago. At this place, three to six months or a year ago, they knew a whole lot more about God. And so Moses comes to this place, fulfillment of God's thing, and God calls him up to the mountain. And God, uh, and Moses goes up to the mountain, and I love these words. Look at me. Look with me. Chapter, um, chapter 19, verse 3. It says, Moses went up, to the, went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the sons of Israel." Now, those are some pretty cool words, right? I mean, God says, listen, you've seen what I've done for you. You've seen that I'm the one who did everything that needed to be done for you. You didn't do anything, right? You, you didn't deserve anything. You didn't, you didn't earn anything in that sense. God had, God had done it all. He had done all the miracles. He had done all the battles for them. They, matter of fact, they didn't even fight any kind of battle until just a few weeks before this. We talked about that last week. Where Amalek comes out and fight, and God finally says, okay, you guys go out and fight with them, but they can't win unless the staff of God is raised. They can't even win. 
So they don't think they're anything. They, they must know they're not anything. God is the one who has done it all. And I love it. He's, he's fought all the battles. He brought them to this place. He's raised them up on eagle's wings. In other words, he's lifted them to the highest heavens. But again, not because they did it. Not because they earned it. Not because they had done anything toward it. But because God simply was faithful. Like we sang about earlier, right? His great is your faithfulness. Great is the faithfulness of God to his people, his people, right? His, his grace and his power are awesome. Um, and, and, and so I want you to notice, look at the promise. So he says, I've done all this, but then there's a condition he puts in there. He says, if you will obey, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among the peoples, for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Um, you know, that's covenantal language right there. That's covenantal language. A commentator said this, the covenant first given to the patriarchs was unconditional in its transmission and bestowal was indeed conditioned with regard to its enjoyment and its personal participation. We had to enter into that relationship, right, with Christ. And with God, they had, to, they had to obey. They had to follow the law. They had to, and they didn't have the law at this point. They just had to obey what God was telling them to do as they were doing it. And his promise, I love this because, right, it sounds awful familiar, this language, doesn't it? I've, I've uh, often, it has, it's been a little while because we're not opening this service anymore with a, with a scripture verse. Um, but... I would often, when we did that, open with 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellences of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Kind of sounds the same, doesn't it? We're his people. Right? He says, in Christ now, and again, like we said, for them, that was the exodus and all that was wrapped around that. They didn't know further. They could just trust God. But for us, it's in Christ, and it's faith in Jesus Christ. And when you have faith in Jesus Christ, uh, to all the faithful, you are a, a chosen nation. I mean, you're, you're a chosen race, the royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. He would say this in another place, Paul. He says, we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. We didn't, we didn't figure out God, right? Amen? God came. How cool that God would love us enough, right? My favorite verse, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die when we got better. He didn't, like, come to us, like, when everything was getting, well, you know, they deserve it now. They deserved it no more than when they were back in Egypt and no more than us when we came to Jesus Christ. How cool is that? Um, and so the people's response to that, look at this, verse 7. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set it before them and set before them all the words which the Lord had commanded him all the peoples answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. That's a good response, right? It's a great response. Um, that's their response, right? Their, their declaration to God is that we're all in. But I'm going to tell you, it's not hard to be all in when, when you're at the mountain of God. Right? When you've seen the miracle of God, when you've seen the hand of God upon your life, and your, your eyes are open and you can see God moving, I would agree with Jimmy sometimes, uh, he kind of referenced this, I think, but you know, we, we, we got to look. Like, open your eyes and see God move. He's moving all around you. He's moving all around you. Right? We, we open our eyes, we see it's not hard to be like, yes, I'm all into that. I'm all in. Our problem is, is that we often condition that. Right? We're like, God, if you, if you do this miracle, then I'll be all in. And that's not how it should work in any way. God's already done it, right? It's not conditional on that. We'll talk about that a little bit. 
All right, so the people, a people for God, up on a mountain of God uh, there, and God says, I'm going to make you my people. You're going to be my nation, my chosen people, my holy nation. I mean, a nation of priests who are before me. All right, then we see the consecration of the people. Look what he says in verse 9. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe in you forever. Then Moses told the words of all of, of the people to the Lord. And the Lord also said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them tomorrow, today and tomorrow. And let them wash their garments, and let them be ready for the third day. And on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set bounds for all the people around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, they shall not live. When a ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. So the Lord tells Moses, listen, you're about to meet with God. This is the first time, by the way, remember this, this is the first time the people of God are coming to a place where God is going to show up personally, if I can say that. Now, I, I get it. He's obviously showed up by, by parting the Red Sea, right? He's been with them in a, a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. But, like, this is like you're, this is God here, people. This is God in this place. This is God's mountain. This is God in this place. And so he tells them to consecrate the people. The Hebrew word there, the base word, for what it is, is the same base word where we have the, ba- the ho- word holy. Again, a commentator says it means to be ceremonial, clean, or pure, to be set apart from that which is perf- profane, and dedicated or consecrated to that which is holy. One of the New Testament words that carries that same meaning is to sanctify or sanctification, that, that process of holy. So as outward signs of an inward heart, They were to wash their clothes, stay away from the mountain, not have and not have sexual relations with their spouse. And you go, that's weird. Now, some of you are like, oh, my grandmother was right. Cleanliness is next to godliness. See? No, that's not what it's saying. Okay. Now, listen, not that I mind in any way that you wash your clothes before you come to church. Please do that. We're clean clothes. We appreciate it. But listen, if you're coming to work and you're in dirty clothes, you're welcome also. All right? So that was that outward sign, right? God is teaching them and beginning to show them this separation and this distinction about who he is and who they are. Who he is and who they are. Uh, And I think that's important to remember. Right? So God is preparing a people to meet with him and to give them the law through Moses. So why all this? And I got to tell you, man, this is, <laughs> it's interesting. We evangelical preachers don't like to preach this stuff because it can easily become this religious repetition. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Now if you don't wear clean clothes to church, you're not right with God. I mean, listen, we get really religious with God very quickly, right? We get really religious with God very quickly. We begin to pick up forms of that. But what you need to hear is, is, is what God's saying in this. What God is saying in this, all right? So, um, and, and let me tell you, there's a, there's a middle ground to this. And I don't mean middle ground being, but uh, my favorite quote outside of Scripture, Robinson McQuilkin, it's easier to go to a consistent extreme than to stay in the center of biblical tension. You know, because what, what we want to do is we want to get real religious and start putting forms and start putting things. Or we get, no, 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 we're in, we're in grace. We're, we're in the time of grace. So, like, none of that matters. Like, nothing matters now. You can do whatever you want. 
All right, and we'll make that distinction here, right? So they need to understand, like I said, who God is and who they are. God is holy, and if God is on the mountain, the mountain is holy. For where God is is holy ground, right? You remember when God first met with Moses, he tried to help him with the distinction. Take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. Why? Because your shoes have walked through all kinds of stuff. And he's just beginning to teach, and now he continues to go that even further, right? So they can't, they can't step foot on the mountain. It's about positioning. It's about understanding. It's about placing yourself under God and who he is, right? Clothes are, are just an outward sign of an inward heart. It's symbolism. And again, like I said, you've got to be careful of religion here. Um, but I'm meeting with the king of kings. I'm meeting with the king of kings. And and I got to be careful. And and listen, I get it, right? Some of you are like right now going, wait, Hebrews chapter 4? Brother, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Some of you are like, what does that say? Well, I'll tell you. (laughs) Right? Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. And it's this thing that, you know, Jesus has been tempted in every way yet without sin. Right? He says, let us... Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace in a time of help and need. That word confidence can mean boldly. And I've always kind of quoted it that way. You know, let's come boldly before the throne of grace. But listen to me. That does not mean flippantly. That does not mean that you are God's equal. Well, but he calls me his friend. You know, so like my buddy right here. No, yeah, you are a friend of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Right? And so we're called to come to God, but we're not called to come flippantly. We're not called to come to God uh, demanding anything. And, and like even what I talked about earlier, right? God, if you'll do this, then I'll do this. Like, like God is some sort of gumball machine. And I really think that a lot of people think that. A lot, you know, that if I put my right thing in, if I pray, then I deserve to get something from God. You deserve nothing from God. Matter of fact, the reason of why you get anything before God, which we get everything of Christ, is by grace. And by mercy. And by his kindness and by his love. And so we are not to approach God flippantly. We're to approach God in humility, knowing always who we are and who he is. Now, does that mean I have to hold back? Well, I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't perfect this week. No. You approach the throne of God confidently because you are in the blood of Jesus. And you are wrapped and shrouded, if we can say, in the, in the clothing of Christ. And so I can, I can approach the throne confidently. I don't have to hold back, right? But again, that doesn't mean I approach flippantly. No sexual relations. That's kind of a weird one, right? Uh, again, I'll go to a commentary. It says this. They were to refrain from sexual activity, not that sexual activity within the bonds of marriage was in any way unclean. As a matter of fact, let me say this. God, God created sex. God is not ashamed of sex. He doesn't mind seeing you naked. He's already seen you naked. I don't know if you know that. Right? So um, God created sex. He created sex in the bonds of marriage to bring people together. It wasn't just for procreation. It was absolutely to bond two people together into one flesh, a very physical symbol of what was to happen in that. And it is holy and righteous and good. In God's system. Holy and righteous and good. And nobody has to be ashamed of it inside of marriage. Ever. Ever. And yet he tells them to refrain from that. Why? Well, this is what he says. But as they prepare to meet God, as they prepare themselves spiritually, they are to abstain from any personal indulgence which would take their heart and mind off of God. As a matter of fact, you know that that Paul had a command for husbands and wives. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. As he's talking about this relationship, he says, stop depriving one another. And, And he's talking about sexual activity here. Stop depriving one another. Stop holding back from that. 
except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So God gave sex to be enjoyed in marriage and to, to bring together. And he says, listen, that should, that should continue. He talks about that I am not my own, but I'm my wife. My wife is not her own, but she is mine. We are together. It's holy and righteous before God. And yet he says, listen, there is a time to, to stop, to not have sex, but only if you're devoting yourself to God so that your mind will be fully and wholly on him. Fully and wholly on him. But that's a defined period, and it's a short period. And so it's that understanding that I, that I come before God with a right heart and a right mind fully given over to him. Listen, one of the, one of the reasons that we, we start with music in the morning, I mean, God tells us to worship. He tells us to sing. Right? We talked about that a few weeks ago. It's not a side thing in church. Music is not sort of something extra in church. It's part of what God commands his people to do in worship. But one of the things we do is we're trying to align ourselves. One of the jobs of the worship team, which is a hard job, is to, is to help you to align yourself with God. And, and, it, and it is to place yourself under. I, I remember the time, I, this was years ago. I was a pastor, though, and I had been a pastor for a few years. Somebody came to me, and, and a woman in our church, not, not here, another church I was in, and, and she's like, man, somebody just shared this at a conference, and they talked about, you know, so often we talk about just, you know, kind of leave everything aside and just come to God and forget about everything and, and just worship him, you know, just put it all aside. And she said, you know, this, this person at this conference said, no, that's not what you're to do. What you're to do is to bring it all in with you into the sanctuary and then to lay it at the foot of the cross. Don't, don't leave it at the door, because you know what happens? If you leave it at the door when you come in, it's still at the door when you go out, right? Don't leave it at the door. You come in and you lay it before God. See, that's posturing before God. You say, Lord, these are all my issues. These are all my problems. These are my health issues. These are my, my mental issues. These are my people issues. These are my wife and husband issues. These are my kid issues. These are my issues. And, Lord, it's hard to concentrate because I'm holding on to them. I'm not giving them to you. And we're to bring them all in. Every single Sunday morning, every single time before God, bring them all in to the throne of grace. And lay them at the foot of the one who can do something about it. The God of miracles. Right? The God who can move. The God who can make something different. You laid at his feet. And you let him have it. Right? And so that's what they're talking about here. They're talking about consecrating yourself before God. It's a great lesson for us. Not outwardly, not religiously, not like you got to wear a certain set of clothes or you got to look a certain way or you got to do something religiously to make yourself right before God. No, no, no. It is preparing your heart rightly before God. It is understanding that you are not worthy and undeserving, and yet he is loving, and he is grace, and he is faithful, and he is God, and I can just place myself under him. Come boldly. Come confidently before God, but come humbly. Come humbly. All right. And then there is this in this passage, God's holy display. Look at it. It's pretty cool. It's, it's pretty wild. And I... And, you know, I, I try to, when, I, when we go through Scripture, I try to help you in some ways to kind of walk in their footsteps. And, and I'm going to tell you, I cannot help you here. I just can't. Because, I mean, we'll read the scene and, and, and see what happens. And, oof, like, but I want you to feel this a little bit. Verse 16. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. I just thought about this. Thunder and lightning crashing around on the mountain and they're intense. You're going to be scared? How many, have you ever been, anybody been tent camping or in a camper out in the, you know, in the thunder and lightning? I have. We wanted to get out of there, right? Um, verse 18, now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. 
And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. Like I said, I I would love to walk. I, I can't make that happen. I don't know. Where are my deacons? Can we make the building shake a little bit? Yeah, I don't really want any of that either. You know, <laughs> I think the roof, and one of you is going to be, I knew the roof would cave in when I came to church. Um, no, no, it hadn't fallen yet. Good job. All right, right? <laughs> um, verse 20, the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. The Lord called to Moses, called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down, warn the people so that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. Also, let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or else the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to the mountain, for you warned us, saying, set bounds about the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you, and do not let the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break forth upon them. So Moses went down and told the people. There is this absolutely terrifying display of God's majesty and magnificence on this mountain. And again, like I said, I would, I would love to be able to walk in their sandals, but I but I don't know. I mean, I've been in an earthquake before, like in my house and things shaking. You know, I can't imagine sitting before a mountain where, where God calls his people out to watch and it is crashing and there's, there's smoke surrounding it, not from fog, but from fire. And the whole mountain quaking. And then, and then Moses speaking and God speaking back and it sounds like thunder. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what the thunder of God sounds like. I, I just know it's... It's amazing, and it's terrifying. It's terrifying, right? This is an awesome power of God on display. So why such separation? Why such terror? Well, because God is holy, and they needed to know that God was calling them to himself, but they were not his equals. They were not his equals. This is God. This is the God who opened up the the rivers and and people walked through on dry ground. On dry ground. That's what I I love about this this, um, background that we've chosen. Because it's cracked ground there. They walked through on dry ground. And then that same sea that they walked through covered the people so that the, the chariots of God were flooded. I mean, the chariots of God. The chariots of Egypt were flooded, and the, the elite of Egypt's armies were killed. Every one of them that was in the sea. Every one of them. This was not low tide. Right? This was the magnificent display of God. And, and you know, they've already had moments after this incident of the Red Sea where they have grumbled and complained against God, like, like where's, I, I need water to drink. And, and as we tried to make it a few weeks ago, I mean, that was a serious situation. This is life or death situation. And when you kind of get into that, you get into the grip of it. I don't even need to get into the grip of it when it's not even life or death. But talking about life or death, man, you really get serious then, right? And they're serious and they're like grumbling and complaining against God and to God and against Moses. And, and, and they're getting familiar with God. And they need to understand that there is no familiarity. I mean, there is a peace that comes because I know God. I am absolutely a friend of God. I can approach him boldly. I can approach him confidently. But he is God, and I am not. I told you about that, that T-shirt I used to have a bunch of years ago, 30-some years ago, right? Two things are true in this world. One, there is a God, and two, you are not him. I am not him. I am not him. God, listen to me, brothers and sisters, and, 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 and in the evangelical church today, we struggle with this. God is not here to serve us. Anybody ever heard of dog and cat theology? I love this. Oh, really? No one? All right. Great book was written. I, I haven't read it. I just know the premise about it, right? So 
dog and cat theology. So, so what it says is this. A dog says, you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me, you must be God. Right? You do all this stuff, you, you must be God. A cat, on the other hand, says, you pet me, you feed me, you shelter me, you love me, I must be God. Right? So dogs, they want to obey their masters. Cat want, cats want their masters to obey them. And somebody said, I was reading about it this week, they said, in fact, masters is the wrong word to use with cats. One person put it this way, dogs have masters, cats have staff. <laughs> Anybody got a cat? I'm sorry. <clears throat> anyway, that's why I'm not a cat person. Anyway, anyway. anyway. Right? But... But I love this, this illustration because in a lot of ways it's true. In a lot of ways it's true. Right? Um, and, and, and it kind of parallels that. So the author of this book, Dog and Cat Theology, they say this. Um, for those who follow dog theology, they say, Lord, you have loved me, you have blessed me, you have provided for me, you must be God. Those who follow cat theology say, Lord, you have loved me, you have blessed me, you have provided for me. I must be God. And I'm going to tell you, in the, evangelical free, in the evangelical church today, we struggle with this. We struggle with thinking that, you know, all right, well, I, you know, God, I know you're God. Like none of us would, would say that I'm equal with God. There's not one person in this room, I hope, and if there are, just kind of separate from them. And the lightning of God comes down. You know, but, you know, not one of us would. We wouldn't say it out loud for sure, right? But too often we're kind of making these demands of God or we're kind of expecting. And you know how it often comes out in the evangelical church? It, it, it comes out, you stop coming to church. You're like, well, I don't know. I'm just like, you know, I'm just struggling so much. And where is God in all this? And, and what is this? And, you know, he's not answering me. Well, I would tell you he's answering you. And maybe he's trying to teach you something. And listen, I'm not trying to be flippant about that. Some of you right now are going through some horrific situations. Horrific. That it, some of you are in horrific situations because of your own doing. Some of you are not. Like this has nothing to do with you. Like it, it, this has nothing to do with you. Like you didn't do anything wrong. And yet health issues or, or things going on. In your life that, that you can't control, it's not your fault. You did well, and it's not your fault. And God still loves you, and he's the same place he was yesterday before the tragedy was announced. He hasn't changed who he is. He hasn't changed one iota. His love for you hasn't changed. Not one iota. Not one. He loves you. And he is for you, and he is with you. Well, if God's with me, why is there such terrifying display of God? Right? Um, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now listen to me. That is not like I'm walking around always scared of God. Oh my goodness, right? I can approach confidently because I am in the blood of Jesus. And if you're not covered in the blood of Jesus... You cannot be confident about that because you stand in your sin. Well, but I come to church every week. God doesn't, listen, you need to come to church every week. You need to be involved in a church. You need to be involved with people. We do online stuff, but online is not church because church is interacting with people. It's encouraging people. It's having them encourage you and you encourage them. Some days you might come to church and get nothing out of it. And yet by your very presence, you've encouraged somebody else. We need each other before God. Right? But, so I don't, I don't need to be afraid, but I need to be afraid. Because <laughs> he's God. And I am not. And how dare I walk before God and... Say, God, you must do this. Now listen, if, if that's where your heart is at that moment, God can handle you shaking your fist at him. And thank God that he has patience with us and doesn't give us what we deserve, which is a spank. And again, I don't know about you, but like a spank from the hand of God is not like the spank from your father. Like it can throw you across the room. 
literally, right? God is the king of the universe. He's the creator of all things. He is worthy to be praised. Israel needed to remember that God was awesome and holy. Church, we need to remember that God is awesome and holy. Don't get religious. Please don't get religious with that. Please don't think that God just wants me to kind of go through the motions and then I can go about and do my own life. God wants it all. He wants every bit of it. Every single bit of it, right? We, we need to know that. We need to know that God is holy and righteous, that, that he is king, that in Christ we are forgiven and loved, that in Christ through faith we are redeemed. Again, like I said, so we can approach him. But God is awesome and terrifying. And again, if he's on your side, that's a good thing, right? It's a good thing. You know, um, approach God boldly. Don't hold back. As a matter of fact, sometimes we, we get to this place, and this is Satan, where we're like, well, I haven't been good this week, and so, like, I don't feel right. I come to church, and I know that everybody is holy. So obviously you're not in our church. <laughs> Just saying. Obviously you're not here because not everybody is holy in any way, right? We get in the way of God constantly. Now, we don't want to. We don't want to, right? What I love about this church is you guys are genuine. We are genuine here. We, we are honest. We, 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 don't, we don't live up to the standard at all times. We know that there's love and forgiveness, but we're striving to be holy in everything that we do. Right? So, so when you walk into this building, you're not walking into a building full of holy. Well, you are working into a building full of holy people, but not holy because they were completely right all week. They're holy because they are wrapped in the blood of Jesus they are clothed in Christ. And so because of that, we can, we can enter into God. We can approach him with confidence, knowing that he has raised us up on eagle's wings. And we will not lose. Amen? We will not lose in Christ. Well, but, but the illness might take me. Where's it going to take you? It's going to take you to glory before God. In mansions of glory before him. Trust, believe, honor, glorify. He is the king. Approach him in love. Father God, I love you. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that we can indeed approach you, Father. But Father, help us to understand that in the approaching of God, that we need to consecrate our hearts. Father, may we even do that right now. Father, let's take a moment. God, just... Um, I want to thank you for your grace toward us. I want to thank you for your grace toward me. I want to thank you that your love and your patience are here. That your forgiveness is abounding. That you throw our sins as far as the east is from the west. And Lord, we, we want to come before you now. and We want to celebrate Lord, what you've done in us, that you have raised us up on eagle's wings. Lord, we haven't gone through the exodus of Israel, but we have gone through an exodus. You have taken us out of our Egypt and you have placed us into your kingdom by grace. And Lord, I I'm reminded and I have to stop because there might be some here who aren't in that kingdom. And Lord, I, I believe that you, by your Holy Spirit right now, are interacting with their soul. And I pray, Lord, that they would see themselves in light of you. And that they would give up on themselves, Lord. They, they can't do it. There's nothing that they can do to be good enough before you. It's only by your grace. And Lord, I pray right now, right now, that they might give up and they might surrender a life unto you. They might say yes. Yes to the love and the forgiveness of God in repentance, knowing that they don't deserve anything, knowing that they are sinners before you. And yet, Lord, your love overpowers all. And so, Lord, may we 
May they, may they just come to you. Father, I pray that they would just come to you right now. Give up on themselves and say yes to Jesus. And then, Father, for those who have, Lord, I pray that we would, <laughs> we would consecrate ourselves right now. We would clean our hearts. Again, not because we were right even maybe this morning, but because we have your love and your forgiveness. And we are your children. And let us walk in that. Let us walk in your grace and your mercy. Let us walk in your holiness and your righteousness. Let us come right now before you in fear but with great confidence that the blood of Jesus covers and forgives so that we might celebrate our exodus into you. God, I love you. I thank you, Lord. I praise you. Lord, you're a great God. It's in Jesus' name we pray.